Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Security Angle. I'm your host, Shelley Kramer, Managing Director of Principal Analyst here at The Cube Research, and I am joined today by my friend and frequent co-host, Joe Peterson, fellow analyst, brilliant engineer, member of The Cube Collective community of independent analysts, and all around brilliant person. Uh, hi, Joe. It's always great to see you. Hi, Shelley. That was, a, that was a nice, very nice intro. Well, I, you know. You're California. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so our conversation today centers on cybersecurity for financial services organizations. And specifically, we're going to take a look at security as it relates to credit unions. Our guest today is wildly impressive. Her name is Stephanie Southard. She's the VP and CISO of BCU, also known as Baxter Credit Union, a state chartered, federally insured credit union headquartered in the Chicago suburbs. But Stephanie's accolades, I mean, seriously, do not stop there. This woman is amazing. She has over 25 years of experience in IT and security, deep expertise in physical and logical governance and risk management and acquisitions and incident response. She's worked in a variety of different sectors, including government, education, nonprofit, and the financial sector. She's an advisory board member for a number of organizations. She's a... <laughs> received more awards and recognition for her accomplishments, honestly, than I can count. She travels all over the world speaking on a variety of topics. And that Stephanie. She is the real deal. Welcome. It's so good to have you. Thank you, Shelly. I, I want to know if you're available to go everywhere with me. Like Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Girl, you just put me in your <laughs> car. <gun>. Please. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, we are thrilled to have you. And this is a conversation Joe and I have both been looking forward to. So to set the stage here a little bit, credit unions are incredibly popular. They serve about 139 million Americans. Um, I'm a member of a credit union. Chances are good that you're a member of a credit union as well. From a cybersecurity standpoint, we know that financial institutions and healthcare are two of the top targeted verticals for cyber threat actors. And what we wanted to explore today is whether those same risks that exist for banks and financial institutions and healthcare entities um, are uh, kind of extrapolate across to credit unions. And, and we also wanted to explore whether credit unions have the same or similar security regulations as their banking cousins. Um, I believe and I would guess that the two of you will agree with me that along with banks and financial institutions, oh. credit unions are not only critical infrastructure, they provide a tasty target for cyber threat actors. Um, for example, last year's third party core service provider ransomware disruption affected 60 small credit unions. Um, the, the reality of it is, to my way of thinking, when you're talking about any kind of financial institution, credit unions included, what they have is lots of personally identifiable information on their customers. And that's what makes them a tasty treat. And I think there's some other things that make them attractive to cyber threat actors. And we're going to dive into that. So, Stephanie, let's start this conversation with an easy one. Do credit unions have the same security risks? that other banks and financial institutions do? Or am I crazy? You're not crazy. And yes, <laughs> they do. It's very similar to what the FDIC, maybe the Federal Reserve Board, and even the Office of the Comptroller um, of the Currency looks like. We do have annual audits, just like most other financial institutions. And they really do a deep dive into our security posture, our risks, our resiliency. And can we really handle if incidents come up? And how quickly does it take us to bounce back and serve our members correctly? So our regulators are the NCUA, which is the National Credit Union Association or agency. And we also deal with state charters. So depending on where you are, a credit union, you also have to comply with those state regula regulations. They both follow the FFIEC guidelines, same as the FDIC. And they're also doing the same as just what we talked about. They're measuring what our posture and our security practices. They're looking at those risks, those security awareness, and really how are we engaging across the organization to not only protect the members' data, but also our company information. 
as you said, we store a lot of information about financial needs, wants, and also transactions. So how do we make sure those aren't getting into the right hands is really where, you know, a lot of our regulatory focus. But we also know how have state privacy policies, right? And where we do business, we also have to comply with those. And that's what's been really hard for not only other financial institutions, but credit unions to follow because most credit unions have smaller security trade teams. Right. So we really have to rely on our legal and our other third party partners to help us meet all of those different pri privacy regulations. That makes perfect sense. You know, one of the things that we wanted to talk about, I think it was June of this year that the chairman of the National Credit Union Administration asked Congress to restore the NCUA's vendor authority over third-party service providers and keeping parity with banks. And he cited a regulatory blind spot that's already had a negative impact on the industry. How would you see this change helping with mitigating security risks for credit union CISOs? Yeah, we were all cheering in the background when he did that. So we definitely had our support. You know, this authority would allow us to examine and enforce regulations on these vendors, some things that are hands filled tied right now. We're able to ensure that they would meet those same standards that we have to comply to. And this move is also seen crucial for enhancing those cybersecurity and overall safety of the credit union systems and what the vendors or services that they're offered. That lack have, of this oversight has been described as an Achilles heel for most credit unions, right? Mm -hmm. So them actually coming in and helping forcing that will help us be stronger in our resiliency. We also don't necessarily have that preview to those fourth parties or beyond. So not only looking at some of those third parties, we're also trying to get the whole scope of all those services being offered underneath the umbrella to our members through those vendors. So we are definitely excited about that and look forward to what kind of authority or control we can now put on our vendors. Yeah, that sounds like a very big step forward and a much needed one. Yes, very much. Absolutely. Stephanie, I'm curious, as you look at the credit union security landscape and you talk to your peers, what are some of the top challenges that they're facing this year? Yeah, quite a few, right? It never changes. We, we always have a list that we are working through. Um, probably one of the biggest ones is the executive alignment and expectations, especially as those have increased over the internal scrutiny, you know, presented by everything that's going on. So both executives and boards are asking more questions and are asking more of our security teams to get more done, protect us, but do it with less as we look at, you know, how the economy has been and, and budgets are shrinking and headcount is not expanding. We really need to make sure that alignment and expectations of the executives and also of the board and making sure what we are sharing can be met and that we can do it together. Um, aligning the security budget along with our risk tolerance. It's always hard to tell where our next threat's going to come from or where those gaps are going to be in our risk. So making sure we have the budget to support that risk tolerance is super important in a lot of CISOs worlds right now. Right. Along with that is also staffing, security staffing and retention. We may get them, but then we may lose them for a better opportunity. And right. lots of folks are now saying, hey, we're going to come back in the office two days a week or we're going to be doing this. And folks really have liked that remote work setting. So we really have to try to, you know, juggle keeping them happy, but also bringing in more of that efficiency and collaboration and teamwork. Um, and then prob probably lastly is just that complex and evolving threat environments. What we're fighting today is not probably not what we're fighting tomorrow. It's what we didn't fight one year, two years ago. And it's probably not what we're going to be looking at, you know, six months to a year from now. So being agile and being able to jump to all those different threats and make sure that we're responding in the correct way. You know, I, I liken uh, the job of a CISO and a security team to coming to work every day and playing a game of whack-a-mole. Yes. <laughs> What's happening today? What's happening? What do I do? Yes. Who is the loudest? Yeah. Yeah. So true. Well, Stephanie, I've had the pleasure of working with you on a couple occasions. And one of the things that I think that you've done really well 
is getting your executive team to understand some of the risks. Like you did a red teaming exercise, or sorry, a tabletop exercise on ransomware for your executives. So they could understand, you know, that was very proactive. Yeah. Um, and I don't see everybody doing that kind of stuff, FYI. Yeah. Um, so how have you been successful in translating cyber risk into more of a business conversation for your C-levels and the board that they can understand? Yeah, love that question, right? And the journey hasn't been easy. There's been hits and misses along the way. But some of those things I found that have been successful is when you're communicating with those C-levels or those shareholders, you have to speak equal parts of security and bottom line. You know, yeah. when CISOs are breaking down a threat, they have to be prepared to show that deeper target, but giving those folks a grasp of what ongoing remediations and cost are. You can't leave them in the dark, especially when you're fighting through incidents or other types of breaches. Okay. Um, I think, yeah, as Gardner said, by 2025, 40% uh, of boards have a dedicated cybersecurity committee with oversight from qualified board members, but fewer than 10% of boards today actually have that cyber specific community in it. Yeah. So how do you change your language? How do you communicate that you're getting across to all of your board members or all of your C-levels? You really have to read how they retain that information. Is it better in a PowerPoint? Is it better in a one-on-one? -on -one? Is it better to send them just articles so they can digest it on their own? Yeah. You really yeah. have to understand that audience and making sure that you're speaking that language so they don't necessarily get caught up in the not important details, but more the important things that you're getting across. You know, Joe and I have talked about this a lot in terms of the, the dearth of any kind of cyber expertise or knowledge um, on boards today and how big of a problem that is. And so it's great to see that beginning to change to a certain degree. But one of the things that I've also... Um, some of the guidance that I've also heard when we're having these conversations is directed to the CIO and the CISO and security teams. Like they need to learn to speak business speak, mm -hmm. not yes. security mm -hmm. speak, and be able to, we're not talking just about cyber threats. We're talking mm -hmm. about business continuity. We're talking about resiliency. We're talking about risk mitigation. We're talking about, again, it's business speak mm -hmm. and learning to be able to sort of level up the way that you communicate with people who don't have that deep expertise is really an important part of this equation, I think. Yeah, no, perfect point. You know, and, and as said, I've done everything. I've gone in and just been very, sorry, my lights just went out. <laughs> I've gone <laughs> and been very technical. Huh. And then I've gone in and been, you know, at, you asked the questions and let me give you the answers. I was yeah. reading an article the other day and, and they said, CISOs try this approach, walk in using the three P's, prediction, prevention, and proaction, and see if they're able to analyze through that. So I haven't tried that, but I thought that made sense. You know, from a prediction, I can tell you, here's what I'm predicting to happen, or here's what's not going to happen. Then prevention, how do we deal with it? But then also proaction. That's not a word we hear a lot. It's more of acting after the fact or, or yeah. going to the biggest fire. But if we can start to show them this is a proaction attempt, maybe they'll start to see the outcomes and what we're really trying to prevent. So yeah. I'll let you know if that one works. Oh, I like that. You have to tell me. That's good. <laughs> yes. The yes. three P's. Yes. I like it. Tell me again what those three P's were. Prediction, Prediction prevention, and proaction. Okay. Okay. That's good. Okay. Well, we'll have, we'll wait to hear from yes. you how that is working for you. So I know that your organization has increased the size of your security team over the past couple of years, and that you've also engaged in some efforts to upskill and cross train your teams. Um, you know, and as we talked about here a few minutes ago, as we opened the show, you know, it's not unusual for credit unions typically smaller organizations, right? And, and you know, this is not true only of credit unions, but there are a lot of small to mid-sized organizations out there. But 
you know, many organizations are, are and have been for years now feeling the pinch of a cyber skills challenge. So when we're when you're talking with other CISOs in the credit union space, what advice do you share with them or would you share with them on this topic? You know, how how the efforts that you've made have paid off for you. And I just love a little bit of a deeper dive there. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, I get that question a lot. Being in a credit union, we're lucky to have 15 people on our cybersecurity team. That's pretty large. That's pretty big. A credit union size, right? Yeah. We, we own resiliency. We own access. We own incident response. But we also own cyber. And really, I give them quite a few things. Start thinking differently. Stop what you're doing. If you think back 10, 20 years ago, cybersecurity was a job of two engineers in a server closet, right? And for days, they were just in there typing away, setting up their security. We're no longer that. We're much more expanded into the business and all of the things that the organization is doing. And, you know, to launch billions of attack each day, cyber criminals employ the most cutting edge technology, including AI and machine learning. Yeah. And now how do we do that? In fighting fire with fire, you know, many cybersecurity leaders have increased their own resiliency or reliance just by being able to look at AI and bring in some of that machine learning. And that one's hard to grasp for folks because we don't want to let go of things. We feel we have to monitor and have an eye on everything mm -hmm. to protect the castle. But looking back and saying, if I can put AI to look at this, or if I can have machine learning monitor this and just notify me of alerts, it saves you time. It lets you look more strategically. It lets you look at that bigger picture. And of course, we're always going to need the humans in today's surface attack, but there definitely is a need for some of that specialized talent in what we're looking to do, right? Yeah. You know, some of the research that we've done and some of the data that I've seen on the on the AI front, the Gen AI front, is that in many instances, it is more senior level executives who are experimenting, playing around with AI and who can kind of understand the benefits and not as many, um, you know, mid-level and lower level folks within an organization. And it could also be, have something to do with time, right? You know, how much time do we have to come to work and, you know, fool around and experiment. But I will say that with my own, um, my husband's in sales for a Fortune 100 organization. And one day I was doing something, I was using, uh, I was using Claude and I was doing something that I thought, you know what, I need to show him this. And he was officing across the house and you know, I said, hey, you know, got a, got a minute, come in here, let me show you something. And I asked him, I said, you know, are you using AI in your organization? And he said, yeah, you know, I'm on a sales team, I, you know, I'm on the road 90% of the time. I'm sure that people within our organization are, it doesn't touch me or my job yeah. today anyway. And I said, let me show you yeah. how I'm using AI. And, and he was like, oh, you know, like, and I'm like, dude, it's going to take two minutes. Uh -huh. And so I show him something and he was just completely gobsmacked. <laughs> And but that's my point. Sometimes it is we don't know what we don't know no. until we know. That's my favorite deadline. And so sometimes it's a matter of just showing that. And you know, and the other thing, Joe and I talk about this all the time, is that you know, the reality of um cybersecurity as it relates to AI is that the the reason that threat actors do what they do is very simple. Financial benefit. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. They want data. They want personally identifiable information. They want information that they can leverage, okay? And often in exchange for money. Yes. And so it only makes sense as the rest of the world is experimenting with and, and you know, learning how to use AI and Gen AI and day-to-day -day operations. Well, they're even more motivated to do that successfully than we are because the quicker they get their arms around this, the more money they can potentially make. And AI is helping them launch 
more sophisticated phishing and vishing mm -hmm. and smishing mm -hmm. schemes and ransomware attacks and all that sort of thing. So really trying to communicate that um, has been something that Joe and I have been very passionate about. But I think that's the, the reality check on the whole AI part of the equation. We can't not rely on AI as part of our security operations because the only way to combat that threat, that outside threat, is to be using some of the same tools and technology that they are. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. One step ahead of them, for sure. Absolutely. You know, and just as you said, let's roll it out. Of course, there's guardrails, you know, and security and rules around it. We can yeah. sign you up for acceptable uses, but know that this can make your job easier in a lot of ways. And it's across the across the board. Yeah. Uh, another way is is encouraging our current employees to seek out learning opportunities and upskilling them so encourage them to go for certifications or other trainings that they desire to grow in your role because right. what i've learned is you can't box them in there's so much that's coming and ever changing in the security realm so them having the desire to go learn and do things only brings it back to better for the whole organization. They're excited about it. They've learned something new and they can really get amped up and want to dive into that yeah. versus mm -hmm. you're going to have to go to this training whether you like it or not. You know, I've seen that work very well. Well, and I think that the reality of it is, and you know, I know all three of us know this, but the reality of it is the more proficient we get with these new skill sets, the more interesting and rewarding our roles within organizations are, the more opportunities can come our way. And and I and I say that as, you know, as an ELS and as somebody who's deeply immersed in this space, and as somebody who's also, you know, heard many, many conversations from employees being fearful of you know, technology replacing them or replacing their jobs or whatever. And the reality of it is there are two things in play here. One, uh, technology is in some instances going to replace parts of jobs. Yeah. Um, the good news is that that should free up right. the rest of it that should free up people mm -hmm. to be able to do things that deliver greater business value that allow them to work alongside the technology and guide and do the critical thinking and all that kind of thing. And I would much rather do that than, you know, mindless data entry. So it is, it is kind of teaching about that opportunity and getting people excited about kind of expanding their career and, and being able to do more and, and, but I think, too, I say this because I have twin 18-year-olds who just are starting their freshman year of college, and we've had many conversations about careers. And one of the things that I've told them is, like, your soft skill capabilities, your critical thinking capabilities, your um, understanding that the today's business landscape and the business landscape that will exist in four or five years when you graduate college is all about understanding how continuous learning is so important. You're not done. You know, you're never done. Mm -hmm. um, so embracing that the mindset of always wanting to learn more and be hungry for more information and more skills and being adaptable and being able to pivot quickly and, and welcoming change, which we are not inherently good at. But those are the kind of things, in my opinion, that really serve all of us well, regardless of whether you're you're an old broad like me or you're a 24 year old just starting in no, the workplace. No, you know. yeah. and, and you're exactly right. And, you know, that leads me to the last point that I discuss when folks are having trouble with shortages. I say, look at schools, look at service members who are just coming out into yeah. the workforce. You know, veterans are coming back with so much skill set that's around cybersecurity that they are great for it. And because of COVID, now geographically diverse, we can go anywhere for yeah. some of these positions, right? And we have to be able to look outside the box. And it's no longer, you know, sitting in a cube nine to five. It's looking for those specific set of skills yeah. and do they fit with the company culture? And the rest we can figure out. Absolutely. I'm so glad that you mentioned vets because that's near and dear, you know, to me as, as a vet and people forget hey, these are people that are great employees because they've got all these skills that not only technical skills, but they're going to show up to work. They're going to, you know, they're going to be, they're going to be um, just good employees. So right. thanks for mentioning vets. Well, and you have such great training in stress situations, right? Yeah. 
an incident, it can be a very stressful situation. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You have one that's very calm <laughs> versus <laughs> someone's like, I have no idea, I'm out of here. Right. I'm in the bed all day long. I think that's you, can a really tell, you, can, you can absolutely get a true measure of the metal of a person, and that is M-E-T-T-L-E, of a person um, navig watching them navigate a crisis. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, you know, some people can do that and do it well, and other people are just a chaotic mess. And yeah. so yeah. it can be challenging. Well, okay, so on the diversity front, and speaking, uh, you know, I just referred to myself as an old broad, um, which is true. And, you know, so here we are, three women in midlife in very senior level roles in an industry that is largely dominated by men. And so I want to talk a little bit about and, and let me back up and say Joe and I are as passionate about supporting women in the technology mm -hmm. space in general and in the cyberspace in particular as we are about supporting vets and so this conversation is coming full circle for us but women only represent about 12 percent of the cyber workforce i know that you've hired and mentored women in the space joe and i have spent our whole careers hiring and mentoring and creating opportunities for women as well we would love your thoughts on why CISOs and senior leaders should double down on finding and attracting talented women in the field to their teams and organizations. Why? The female CISO is so powerful, right? And watching it unfold in front of me in other CISOs, not only in the financial world, but the others that I've walked in, walked walked and worked in, you know, it, it, they bring so much. It's their leadership and that in vision. They can inspire and guide their teams effectively. And I'm not saying that men can, but you can see it happening in front of you. And they can pick up those that are kind of sluggish and maybe not so much on the team and guide and have those interactions with them to really make them feel part of that trained team and wanted and shared communication yeah. skills. You know, female CISOs excel in articulating complex security concepts to non-technical stakeholders right. and fostering a culture of that security awareness. It's much easier to sometimes go have that conversation with someone that's gonna be very calm and culturing, especially if you're talking about something like, hey, I just clicked on something that I'm not sure I wanted to, or hey, this looks a little suspicious. There's a little bit more ease in going through that when you feel someone is on the other end is empathetic, right? Yeah. And easy to talk to. We're very adaptable and we're resilient. It just comes in the females that we are. And, you know, security landscape is constantly changing and we have to be adaptable and resilient. And we're able to do that. And we can navigate pretty quickly and we can respond to those threats and challenges. Yeah. And it's the collaboration and teamwork, just as I said. We build strong relationships because we want to not only build, but we want them to feel like they're part of it. And they are a strong part of what we need to be successful. Yeah. We're yeah. problem solving, you know. Well, and I, I look at it and I think that, you know, and and men are fantastic, but we're wired very differently, uh, mm -hmm. men and women. And, you know, we bring nurturing. We bring the ability to multitask probably better than most yeah. men do simply by virtue of the fact that many of us are working wives and moms and navigating all kinds of things, yeah. uh, leading teams, building and growing companies, all of that sort of thing. And what's for dinner, you know? <laughs> it's right. That. And, and your and, laundry's done, you know? Right? Oh, let me go between this call and the next call. I'm going to go throw a lot of laundry in uh, because the laundry operation can never stop, you know? And and so, so we're nurturing, we're collaborative by nature, we're communicative, um, we're teachers in many instances. Yes. And, and I think that, you know, I have always described myself and that one of my superpowers is that I can operate, I can function well in a high state of chaos. And I think that many women in, in CISO roles and in leadership positions are similar. And, and I think the last thing that I always look for, that I think is just an important thing that women bring to the table is that we are exceptionally detail oriented. Yeah. And when I compare sometimes the performance of my male teams and my female teams, it's just, you know, 
women don't, women understand that the devil is in the details and yes. that quick and sloppy is not always good enough. And, and I, I've had colleagues that I've worked with that I adore over the years for whom quick and sloppy down and dirty is fine. And I think there's a happy medium in there. So I think that there, there are, um, you know, diverse teams do better work. We produce better outcomes and, um, you know, but it, it does seem that based on the lack of traction that we have on this front and the fact that we've got, you know, a penetration of 12% in the cyber industry, this does remain a significant challenge. And, and my hope is that conversations like this and insights like this will ultimately help organizations work harder to add women to their cyber teams. I mean, there's, there's no downside. Yeah, no, I absolutely love it. And, you know, the one I struggled with mostly is women are more empathetic and most yeah. when they have emotional intelligence. I can't tell you the number of times I apologize because I thought I was getting emotional in a conversation <laughs> or I would just apologize. Yeah. Right. It finally took me to say, quit saying you're sorry because yeah. you're bringing something to this conversation. No one else is. And we need to be empathetic. We need to show emotion and have that intelligence behind it because we have to work through that. They need that, you know, to, to be able to get to the other side. So it took me a while to think, don't go in and apologize. You know, if you get frustrated, don't apologize because it's all part of us getting through to the other side. It's part of our problem solving. It's part of our creativity. It, yeah. it really is who we are. And it's just part of it. And, you know, thank goodness my boss has always said, I appreciate that, right? Because I don't get that perspective from necessarily my male managers and above. So, yeah. you know, it's great that now it's starting to be accepted and we're yeah. allowed to be that way. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times I have had to, I mean, lecture myself on don't apologize right don't use the word just ever unless you're talking about justice mm -hmm. i'm just writing to check uh -huh. on i was just wondering you know yeah. like, like things like that and and i've also had moments in my career where i started my first company when i was 34 and i've had many moments in my career where i was putting together a proposal i was having a conversation and i literally had to step back and say to myself Okay, what would a guy do? Because that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, right. sometimes you need that from a negotiating standpoint or whatever, but it is funny how you have to train your brain not to do certain things. Joe, I know you've experienced this. Oh, yeah. But, you know, I was thinking about something else. I had a last question for you, Stephanie. Yeah. I've been lucky enough to meet most of your team. And one of the things that I found interesting about the people that you hired is their various backgrounds. Yeah. So you take chances. Mm -hmm. You bring in people from other domains, which I think is is how you solve sort of the shortage problem, right? Yeah. I've seen you take people in from other domains and go, they're smart. I've worked with them before. I know that they can learn this. So, and I don't always see your male counterparts do that. I'm sorry. Yeah. So what advice would you share about just kind of, you know, nurturing that talent from other parts of the organization. You hit you hit it on the nail the head on the nail with you have to give them a chance. You have to invest in them, right? Mm -hmm. If they're coming to you and they feel that they're for that role and they have that desire, nine out of the ten times it's gonna work right? Because they want to do good for you as much as you want them to do good for the company. And it really is that mentoring them and helping them through those things that maybe others wouldn't see that have come up in the ranks through those other fields. And it's just believing in each other. You know, we, we work in high trust situations. We may have to all jump on a call at three in the morning on a Sunday morning to, you know, Monday at 6 p.m. And having that team and that camaraderie Moderate <laughs> cannot speak today, ladies. <laughs> it's a perfect day to do this. It's yes. essential, right? They all have to feel value. They have to feel part of it. And it's so important to keep it fresh and to keep new thoughts and new ideas. You have to be that devil's advocate. You have to be that supporter. You have to be everything they need you to be to see that world. Yeah. And it's it's great to sit back and watch because so many people have gone through the ranks and, you know, you look on LinkedIn and now they're their own CISO or they're filling some other completely different role. And they'll tell you, 
I did that because you believed in me. You gave me that chance and I shined, right? And there were times where I wish people would have done that for me. And there are times when people did that for me. And when you feel both sides of that, you truly appreciate it and you want to share that with others. Yeah. And there's nothing more rewarding. I mean, I've, I've had the same path. I've had people who've done that for me and I've done that for many, many people who worked for me over the years. And it is such a wonderful, rewarding feeling to know that you've really kind of changed the trajectory of somebody's career. And, and I think that, you know, especially when it comes to other women, um, you know, reaching out that hand, helping somebody up, uh, that's how we make our path forward. And, and a lot of times it, it is that, that collection of female leaders and friends that we have and things like that. And not that, I mean, some of my earliest mentors were great and very successful men yes. and um, nothing against male mentors at all. But sometimes as a woman, I just feel such, most times as to feel such a responsibility to be the person who can extend that hand, who can help somebody along, who can give somebody, who can, who can be confident in somebody's ability to shine in a new role with new responsibilities. And it's just so wonderful and rewarding to see that, you know, when you knew that they could do it and you see them and, and how happy they are, it's, it's yeah. so yeah. rewarding. Yeah. I, love yeah. It. yeah. I totally agree. And I'm not going to lie. If, if I see an employee in another department that I don't feel is being valued or they have interest and they just can't make that move, I'm going to go over and poach them, right? Yes. So, oh, yeah. It's been no, right. no, don't let, don't let Stephanie talk to your team, but I'm going to tell you, <laughs> if I choose a poacher, I'm crossing the fence. I love it. I love it. I love nice. it. Well, Stephanie Souders, VP and CISO at BCU, I knew this was going to be an amazing conversation and you've shared so many, so much advice and insights and, and we so appreciate that. And, you know, Joe and I knew this was going to be a fabulous conversation and you have totally hit it out of the park. So thank you so much for joining us today. We really enjoyed the conversation and we will look forward to having you back again and to talk about some more interesting things in this space pretty soon because you've been awesome. <laughs> well, thank you for having me and absolutely glad to, to chat with you ladies anytime. Lots to talk about. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I am your host, Shelly Kramer, Managing Director of The Cube Research. And thank you for tuning into The Cube and to the security angle. And we will see you here again next time.